Well, welcome. Um, I'm so glad to see that all the speakers made it, even virtually, um, <laughs> to this workshop. It was far from being certain that all of you would, would be able to, to show up, and I'm delighted that you made it. Um, and, uh, and I really look forward to today's discussions. Um, Eula's already st started to talk about uh, the background and the context. Um, I want to use the next 15 or so minutes to expand on that a little bit um, and, uh, and, and, and just try and place this language issue in a, in a, wider, in a wider context. Now, the last 10 years um, have seen astonishing changes in uh, the landscape of academic communication. Um, we witnessed the quickening of Web 2.0 use amongst academics um, that's demonstrated by the rise of initiatives such as Academia, EDU, uh, PLOS One, eLife, the academic exchange on Twitter and Facebook, not to forget the exponential expansion of the academic blogosphere. I don't even want to talk about open data and digital humanities um, endeavors and so on. Now, those invo involved in this brave new world of 21st century academia have to address the following question. In what language will I participate? Now, this um, may not be a headache for uh, native speakers, but for those of us who work in a non-English speaking environment and or who are not native speakers of English, uh, making this choice is rather fundamental. It can have significant consequences um, on the reach of our communication as well as its nature. It can have significant, um, it, it can also um, have, um, uh, it can also lead to, sorry, it can also lead to somewhat peculiar situations like the one that I'm just found myself in and that you find yourselves in, um, which is um, that we are at a German speaking university. Right. Most of us are native speakers of German, and here we are happily conducting a workshop in English. Um, when designing a MOOC, this question of, um, of the language is surely one of the first that we encounter. Yula's already shared some of the background of our current MOOC project um, and the inevitability of our language choice. It does what it says on the can. It's, uh, it's academic um, writing in, in English. But I would like to use uh, the following minutes to reflect a bit more on the ramifications of this language decision. My take is that this choice is a pedagogical as well as a strategic instrument which can help us calibrate at least least to some extent our audience and the context in which our MOOCs exist. Um, now, various factors play into this, uh, in, into this language decision. Uh, this is an initial, initial and by no means exhaustive list that I put together um, of factors that play into, into, that, uh, into making that call. Um, I, have, uh, I have three categories here, the course itself, the production of the course, and the context in which the course needs to be seen. Um, the course, of course, um, has pedagogical ramifications. Um, you, you have to consider the topic that you, that you cover, the goal, the pedagogical goal which you, which you intend to um, reach with it, and as Julia's already started to, to mention, the intended audience. And, uh, and I differentiate here between the immediate and the extended intended audience. In the end, we have no idea who dials into the MOOC, um, but I think here we can, here we can make some decisions um, uh, as to how widely it's distributed. Um, in terms of production, um, these are the circumstances, um, things like platform choice, is there technical support um, in, your, in your language, is there um, um, primary material available? Right? If you want to work with um, CC0 or CCBY uh, primary material on your MOOC, um, you, will, you will increase your, your sources manifold if you, um, if you are working in English for example. And of course, something as pragmatic as the team, where I have a team of um, six, or, um, eight, eight people, um, and all of them speak English, and only four of them speak German, so there you go. Um, and lastly, there is the context. And of course, um, uh, the MOOCs exist within the context. We just started talking about that in the, in the lead up to the, to, to the workshop. Um, the institution itself 
has a goal, has some some say um, and some visions for hopefully um, for for what MOOCs will do for it or with it. Um, uh, the funding instruments uh, money comes from the ministry in Stuttgart, as Jules already um, uh, mentioned. But they're in a way a relay station because the original money comes from Europe, right? It comes from Brussels. It's a European um, funding instrument. So they have a certain interest. In fact, the call for this MOOC is explicitly um, uh, encouraged um, uh, uh, applications that would uh, uh, that would be geared towards initiatives in English. And of course, there's a political dimension to this as well. Um, I'd like to continue with this last point a little longer with the idea of strategy and explore this overarching issue of strategy and what, uh, what Julia also mentioned, this notion of internationalization. And internationalization is undoubtedly at the core of these stakeholders' um, strategies and interests. Um, let's look at the current statistics for Europe. Right, MOOCs in Europe. This is a current uh, current statistic from Open Education Europe from their website, and you see here that the number across um, uh, across the Union uh, of MOOCs available is 770. Right now, there's two things that are very interesting here. The first thing is that the number of MOOCs themselves have doubled within the last year across the Union. There was 345 a year ago. So that's a significant growth. And, um, and the other interesting thing about this thing is that um, you see that um, the three leading countries in terms of producing MOOCs, um, Spain, France, and the UK, all are home to a world language. Right. Um, and that means that their potential audience is by default significantly higher, significantly larger than MOOCs produced in a, uh, in a less widely known language. Now, in concrete numbers, um, this looks as follows. On the left hand side, you see the search mask from the same website, um, Open Education Europe. And um, of the 770 MOOCs that we saw, uh, you can see under the filters by language, 437 are in English. Um, that is more than the next three languages put together. Right? Um, and if you remember, the MOOCs produced in, uh, in the UK and in Ireland um, put together is 177. So there's a lot of MOOC production outside of the native uh, language environment. Um, this shows la rather clearly, I think, where the trend within European MOOC production is going. Interestingly enough, however, if you look on the right-hand side, there seems to be a kind of a counterpoint to this development. Um, this is taken from um, uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, statistic um, um, showing the development of MOOCs um, on the platform Coursera. Um, in January 2013, they offered their MOOCs ex uh, exclusively in English. But by the end of the same year, there seems to be a diversification that has happened, and they started to open up to other languages. Um, but of course, Coursera is not restricted, if you wish, to Europe. It's a global undertaking, and that's, um, that segues into the next point I would, uh, I would like to talk about, and that is the, the global con context of MOOCs and the language choice. Um, the defining hallmark of open science and open education is, of course, that there are no longer any a priori limits to our communication. Um, if it is on the web and if it is open, anyone can access it. Um, and that is the terrifying beauty of this entire development, right? Um, however, that doesn't mean that everyone can understand or participate in this communication. Um, so when folks like digital thinker and MOOC pioneer Chris Old speaks, uh, speak of MOOCs as post-national uh, phenomena, the assumption is very much that the language of the MOOC is not necessarily an obstacle. It has to be a language that transcends national borders. Um, this can be illustrated with a visualization that I found um, of MOOC enrollment at MIT as of February this year. Now, According to their website, MIT offers 46 MOOCs, um, 44 of which are in English and two are in Arabic. Um, and if you look at the enrollment number, 
that's 822,000 people, um, and particularly the distribution of their MOOCs. I mean, there's hardly a place on the planet that isn't touched by MIT MOOCs for some reason. Um, you, you can just see how truly post-national, or if you wish global, the dissemination of these courses uh, can be, and that hinges to no small measure on the fact that they are offered in English. Now, some people might find this concerning, perhaps even smacking a bit of linguistic and digital hegemony. Um, and we all know that there is skepticism regards the merits of MOOCs, often precisely because they seem so American, so Anglophone, with their unquestioning use of English and their potential for business development and their readiness to unhinge traditional learning approaches, including distance learning. But while these discussions are healthy, and I encourage them, and I hope we're going to have some in, in, in the follow-up, um, um, the matter is not quite that straightforward. Let me go back to Chris Olds once more. You can tell that I've been reading a lot by him lately. Um, there's a quote that I found um, um, concerning this, this, this skepticism. Are the US MOOCs American through and through? No. Some of the key thinkers and backers of U.S. MOOCs, Stephanie Collar of Coursera, was born in Israel, Andrew Ng of Coursera, who was born in England but educated in Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, Sebastian Trun of Udacity, who was born in Germany, and El Rafael Reif of MIT, who was born in Venezuela, are all uh, uh, types of global citizens one uh, frequently finds in universities like Stanford and MIT, and I would argue after what, uh, what, um, what Yule has um, said at the beginning, also at universities at, as ours, right? Um, in other words, MOOCs are devised by, Chris Olds would have it, global citizens and made by multilingual educators for a post-national audience of students. Now, from these rather lofty heights, um, let me return to the issue of language choice at the course level. While MOOCs may not be an educational phenomenon that can be defined in national terms, the language choice that so fundamentally informs them um, is a crucial instrument in determining and to some extent controlling the makeup of the audience. By the same token, the choice of language for a MOOC will ideally be motivated by its contents, be it in terms of approach or subject. Let's go back to my initial slide of factors um, to consider when we choose um, uh, the language of a MOOC, and I've made up a course that I know nothing about, so bear with me. Um, if we were to devise a course on anatomy and physiology, it's a great topic, it's an introductory topic um, in medicine, um, and we were to do it in German, there is a whole rake of um, uh, of motivations that could play into this into this um, into this decision. Right. If you wanted to offer an overview of the build and functionality of the human body in German to, say, first-year medical students at German-speaking universities, um, we would also be able to reach, I don't know, high school students, gymnasial um, students, college students, and people who are interested generally in, in, um, in healthcare fields. Uh, and the choice might be motivated by a whole rake of different things. Um, things like specific requirements at German-speaking universities in the field of medicine. The terminology is not doesn't make much sense if you want to want to enter the um, the, the medical fields in, in in say Switzerland, and you learn your an art to be 101 in I don't know Portuguese. That might not be very helpful. Um, and of course, the specific approach uh, approaches, academic approaches that. Uh, that uh, German-speaking medical sciences may have to, to, um, to their course of study. And, and you see there are three dots, so I'm open to more suggestions. I would like to populate that list. And since we have some people here who have already successfully done MOOCs and know a lot about MOOCs, please let me know. I want to expand the list. Um, to summarize, choosing the language of a MOOC is a fundamental decision that should not be taken lightly. It should be motivated by the content and or the intended audience. Um, it should consider the pertinent strategies of the stakeholders that are involved. And it should be realistic in terms of production parameters. Um, the last point is a space to watch, I think, because we are currently looking at monolingual or at best bilingual MOOCs. And who knows, eventually we might see MOOCs function like DVDs did. Anybody still use DVDs? DVDs did, right? The audience will be able to select the language 
um, that they choose. I look forward to our discussions. Thanks again for coming, and thank you. Thank you.